power of genetic engineering to take the traits of one species and give it to another. Now, according to the survey, all of you have an opinion. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. But you all have an opinion without really knowing why. Now, I'm here to tell you the truth about genetic engineering and why you should demand labels. Now, I know because I'm studying to be a genetic engineer myself. Now, according to the survey, 93% of you consume GM food. 79% of you are convinced that it is either safe or dangerous. But of that 79%, only one of you fully understand food labels, according to the answers. That's um, pretty significant. This is an example of the modern condition. We all have opinions that we like to spread as facts. But the truth is, we don't know. We don't know if it's safe, and we don't know if it's dangerous. So what's the problem? According to the FDA, now this is a quoted statement by the FDA in 1992, which remains official policy, and I quote, the agency is not aware of any information showing that foods derived by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way, or that, as a class, foods developed by the new techniques present any different or greater safety concern than foods developed by traditional plant breeding. Now that makes a lot of sense if it were based entirely on fact. But again, we don't know. According to a more recent study, just this year, by the University of Sherbrooke in Canada, pesticides produced by some GM crops have been found inside the bloodstream of women, both pregnant and not, showing that there's a certain difference now. You can't just wash it off, it's there in the food produced by it. But again, we don't know what the risks are with that. We just don't know. Now, I personally notified the FDA of this twice since this study. Nothing's been done. That's the power of just one voice, though. Now, another problem is the science behind genetic engineering. The thing is, the premise is faulty. Now, I'm sure as many of you have heard about it, is that they just cut one gene out of one species and give it to another to give it these new traits. You might want to give um, the apple the vitamin C of the orange, for example. But the thing is, you can't just cut and paste genes like that because genes do more than one thing. Now, according to the um, Project ENCODE, now Project ENCODE was the result of the Human Genome Project. And they found a very interesting thing. It debunked the idea that each gene is independent because our bodies only have about 20,000 genes, but we produce over 100,000 proteins. Each gene does more than one thing, but there's one other really significant difference. And I'm gonna show you a video showing exactly what that difference is. This is a PBS program called What Darwin Never Knew, and here's one minute from that. They concentrated on a group of genes known to control the growth of birds' faces. As they looked, they saw something intriguing. One particular body plan gene became active in the ground finch with the short, thick beak on the fifth day of development. But it didn't go to work in the cactus finch with its long slender beak for another 24 hours. This was a revelation. The same genes were responsible for the beaks in all types of finch. Any differences were in timing and intensity. We've got it, we nailed it. It's the same genes in making a sharp pointy beak or a big broad nut cracking beak. What's essential what makes the difference, and all the difference, is how much you turn a gene on, when you turn it on, when you turn it off. That is pretty important. You see, that's the new science of epigenetics, or above the genome. Now the thing is, when we put a gene into a new life form, we can assume what it will probably do, but we don't know for how long it will do that. As this video showed, 
every single finch in the world has the same gene, but for many beaks and many diets. That is very important to know. So this is the problem that we're facing. The science behind genetic engineering is faulty, and again, we don't know. Now, but of course, since we don't know, we can't prove it's dangerous. Many of you might be thinking, well, that means we haven't proved it's dangerous yet. But it works the other way around. Now, in science, we have what's called the precautionary principle. This is very, very important to the basis of science and industry. Now, the precautionary principle states that if an action might cause harm to the public or to the environment, might. In the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking the action. Now, because this is a new science, because we don't understand the consequences, and because we do not understand how it's even working, this policy should apply. We should assume that it is harmful and require these companies to prove it's safe. But of course, they are required to prove it's safe. They're required by the FDA to do their own studies, but they do the studies. They tell the FDA that it's safe. We do not have any oversight. Now, these are why the labels are needed. The scary truth, to sum it up, is that we don't know enough about the science to be sure about the safety. Lack of labels is what keeps us from knowing. We've had this science for over 20 years now, and we are probably one of two or three of the only countries in the world that don't have this oversight. We cannot prove injuries because we don't know. We can't prove they're safe because we don't know. And we can't assure the public of either. Because there's no labels, it promotes conspiracy theories. Everyone has an opinion, and you know, when you don't know, people talk. And it encourages people to, in, to form strong opinions without facts, as much of this class has already done. Now, and again, even if some crops do prove to be dangerous, that still would not prove that all GM crops are dangerous. S the other f important factor that we need to look at is allergies. Um, I know of one case that occurred where an alleged occurrence of peanut allergies, but I couldn't find any verification of that, so I couldn't give you an exact example. But there are many alleged allergens that are introduced in the foods from other foods. Uh, we see contains peanuts. We don't see contains peanut genes, for example. Um, and then there are new allergens. Our bodies are adapted to the foods we're eating. We're not adapted to eating um, certain combinations. We don't know what allergens might <coughs> result. Now, once we have these labels, it will allow patients to report new conditions to their doctors. It will allow doctors to separate factual conditions from hysteria and will allow the consumer, most importantly, the freedom of choice. So here's what you can do. You can write the FDA at FDA.gov in the Contact Us section. You can write your federal and state representatives at Congress.org. And you can talk to people you know about it. One person, one voice doesn't make a difference. But all our voices have power, have weight, and have influence. And it's very important that we speak so we know what we're doing. Thank you.